Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, praise the Lord. God bless you. I'm Pastor Rudy Mosley, Senior Pastor of Bread of Life International Worship Center. I want to say congratulations to you. Congratulations to your family. Congratulations to everyone connected to you. Because what the step that you've just taken in your walk with God, the step that you've just taken in your life, is the greatest decision that you can ever make. And in this class, what we're going to talk about is what is step two? What is the next step in your spiritual journey? What's the next step in your spiritual growth and development? After anyone accepts Christ as their personal Lord and Savior, the Bible speaks of two. Two ordinances. An ordinance is a directive. An ordinance is an expectation. It's, it's, it's a command that's given. Two things that Jesus said that every kingdom citizen, every believer in Jesus Christ, every follower of the way, every person who has made Christ their Lord and Savior has to participate in these two ordinances. These two ordinances don't mean that you're, you don't have to do it to be saved. You do it because you're saved. Yes. So the ordinance that we're going to be talking about today is baptism. Baptism is incredible. And, and I want you to know that, that Jesus wasn't the only person who baptized individuals. What baptism represents, it represents that you are now going to adopt the teachings of Jesus Christ. You're now going to follow the way of the master. You're going to follow the way of the Lord. You're going to make his teaching the pref chief and primary resource, primary source that you actually subscribe to. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. That's what it means to be baptized. So baptism is one of the two ordinances in the church, in the Christian church. It symbolizes that spiritual life has truly started. It is a public confection public confession and a picture of a person's faith in Christ. It's a public confession and a picture of a person's faith in Christ. Baptism is the only, baptism is not only a public confession, but it is also a physical demonstration of what happens in the spirit when a person accepts Christ as their personal Lord and Savior. It's an outward expression of of an inward change. It's an outward expression <laughs> of something magnificent that has taken place in your life. Some call baptism, as I said before, an outward expression of something that has taken place on the inside. Though baptism is not a requirement for salvation, it is an act of obedience to the scriptures once a person has accepted Christ as their savior. The ordinance of baptism by immersion is found in the following scriptures. Let's look at them together. The first scripture we're going to look at is Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Let's go there. Matthew 28. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Lord, you're worthy. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. And this is what it says. And this is what it says. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always, even until the very end of the age. So we see the command there by our Lord and Savior over 2,000 years ago because he's in charge of the church. He's in charge of this organization. We choose to be a part of this organization. He doesn't force anyone to be a part of the church at large. He invites us to be a part of it. He invites us to accept his free gift of salvation. And, and part of the acknowledgement of that, it's like a... It's like a rite of passage. <laughs> so when you want to be a part of a family, there are certain steps that you got to go through. And so this is one of the steps that you got to go through as a kingdom citizen. Let's look at Mark chapter 16, verse 16 and 16. Mark 16, verse 16 and 16. Praise God. Hallelujah. And this is what it says. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved. But whoever does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up snakes and with their hands 
They will drink deadly poison and it will not hurt them at all. They will place in their hands, they'll place their hands on sick people and they will get well. The third scripture that we're going to look at is Acts chapter 10, verse 47. Acts 10, verse 47. Let's go there. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Because see, the reason why we're going through these scriptures is because God's word is the final authority. God's word was God, God breathed for the teaching, for rebuking, for edification, for knowledge and wisdom. It's God's word, God's, God's commands, God's um, the constitution of the kingdom. Whichever terminology you want to use, it's God's final authority. So we go to God's word as the final authority to, to plan out how we live our lives. So Acts chapter 10, verse 47, it says, Then Peter said, Surely no one can stand in the way of their being baptized in water. They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So we ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. So we see there in the book of Acts that there were some folks that, that actually they were not Jewish. They were non-Jews. They were called Gentiles. And the Holy Spirit descended upon them because their hearts were pure. The Holy Spirit is our divine connection to the kingdom of God. So when a person gets saved, a person gives their heart to Jesus, the gift that Jesus brings is the Holy Spirit. And so what Peter saw was that these folks were pure in heart and the Holy Spirit descended upon them. So he said, you know what? What's stopping them from being baptized? And so they baptized them. The next scripture I want you to look at is Romans chapter 6, verse 4. Romans 6, verse 4. Let's go there together. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Romans 6, verse 4. And what it says is, We were therefore buried with him through baptism unto death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. Hallelujah. This practice of baptism was universally practiced in the early church. Romans chapter 6 verse 3 teaches us that all of us have been baptized into Christ Jesus and we have been baptized unto his death. Death. The next question that we're going to look at is who should be baptized? Who should be baptized? That's a great question. Every person who accepts Jesus as their personal, who should be baptized? Every person who accepts Jesus as their personal Lord and Savior should be baptized. A person who has sincerely repented of their sins and exercises a living faith in Jesus Christ should be baptized. So any person who has repented, what does repentance mean? It means a change of thinking. It means I'm going in a different direction. It means I've changed my life. I've changed my direction. My motive in life has changed. So any person who's sincere about that in terms of living for Christ, that's a person who's ready for baptism. So let's look at some scriptures. First scripture is Acts chapter, first, so let's look at some scriptures. The first scripture is Acts chapter 8, verse 3 and 7. Let's go there. Who should be baptized? Acts chapter 8, verse 37. Hallelujah. Acts chapter 8, verse 37. And it says, As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. What can stand in the way of me being baptized? What can stand in the way from me being baptized? So what was happening there? Philip came across a gentleman who was called in the scriptures an Ethiopian eunuch. He explained the scriptures to him. The guy gave his heart to the Lord and he understood that he needed to be baptized. And so he said, here's a body of water right here. What's stopping me from being baptized right now? We're going to talk more about the method of baptism and, and who was qualified to baptize somebody else. We're going to talk about that in this class today. Number three, the third scripture that we're going to look at in who should be baptized is found in 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. Let's go there. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. 
And this is what it says. First Peter chapter three, verse 21. And it says, and this water symbolizes baptism that now saves you. Also, it's not the removal of dirt from the body, but the pledge of a clear conscience towards God. It saves you by the resurrection of Jesus Christ, who has gone into heaven and is at God's right hand with angels, authorities, and powers in submission to him. So basically, what baptism, who should be baptized? Any person, any person who has pledged to have a clear conscience towards God. The only way you can have a clear conscience towards God is to accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, to, to receive the free gift of salvation. See, all we like sheep have gone astray. All of us have fallen short of the glory of God. All of us have gone our own way. All of us have fallen short and have offended God and, has been has, and we have been an offense to the kingdom of heaven. But thanks be to God, we all deserve to go to hell. We deserve, we are guilty as charged. But Jesus, Jesus, stood in our place and paid his life for our penalty. He laid his life down as the payment for our sin. And so when we accept that truth, we accept that reality that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son and whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is the most important decision. This is the good news. This is the good news of the kingdom no matter what country you're a part of, no matter what country you live in, no matter what language you speak. This is the gift of God. The gift of God to humanity is his son Jesus because he knew that we had a debt that we could not pay. And so when you look at your life and you think about some of the things that you've done, some of the things that you've thought, some of the things that you've said, some of the places you've been, and you know that those things were not pleasing to God, and you say, God, please forgive me. I accept Jesus. Then what it is you're now saying, I'm no longer going to live for me. I'm going to live a life that's pleasing to you. Amen? Praise God. The next question that we're going to look at is, why should you be baptized? So we looked at what is baptism. We looked at who should be baptized. Now we're going to look at why should you be baptized? Baptism is an act of obedience and it serves as a rite of passage into the entrance of the Christian church. The person who was baptized is the person who declares to the world, declares to their family, declares to their friends, declares to some people that may not like them. They're declaring that they have died with Christ and that they have also been raised with him to walk in newness of life. That is what, that is why every person should be baptized because you're communicating to the world. There's been a change, a great change. A great change has taken place in my life and I'm excited and I want to tell the world about it. Hallelujah. I don't want to keep it to myself. You know, any person who gets saved, we always teach them, always teach people, once you get saved, go tell somebody. Tell somebody about what happened. Tell somebody about what happened in your life. Share with them, this is what happened in my life. Number four when should you be baptized? When should you be baptized? A person should be baptized after they have fully repented of their sin and they truly are prepared to make Jesus Christ their Lord. That's when a person should be baptized. A person who has already demonstrated that they are living a life for Jesus. Hence, we do not baptize babies. We actually do baby dedication. So here, here at Bread of Life, we... When it comes on to baptisms, some people look at baptism as a, as a great ceremony. And it is a great ceremony. And it's a ceremony that everyone gets excited about. But we got to understand, you know, when should a person be baptized? When are they ready to be baptized? And they should be ready to be baptized when they fully repented of their sin. And so infants, they're not aware of sin. They're not conscious of sin. So I know in some traditions, we have infant baptisms. And I understand the theology behind it because you want to seal that person into the family of God. But at the end of the day, Every person has to make their own decision and their own choice. I can't, I can't um, force my kids to follow God. I can't live my life for them in hopes that my life will qualify for their life. 
Everybody has to stand before God on their own. And they have to fall in love with Jesus on their own. They have to accept the fact that Jesus died for them on their own. And so, when should you be baptized? If you're watching this video right now and you're saying, Pastor, you know, I really want to change. And I know that there's a change that's been taking place in my life. You are a prime candidate for baptism. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Question number five. How should you be baptized? This is a great question. How should you be baptized? Now, the Greek word baptizo means immersion. It also makes sense to assume that by immersion in the early church, based on the scriptures about baptism found in John chapter 3, verse 23, proselyte baptism represented the heathen conversion to Judaism. This was done by immersion. Immersion represents the death, burial, and resurrection. Let's look at Romans chapter 6, verse 14. Romans chapter 6, sorry, verses 1 to 4. Romans 6, verses 1 to 4. Let's go there. Praise God, praise God, praise God. Romans chapter 6, verses 1 to 4. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We are those who have died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Or don't you know that all of us who were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live to new life. So what baptism represents, it represents the reason why we do immersion and we don't do um, you know, sprinkling of water on the head, on the forehead. It's because what baptism represents, when you go down, you go down into what's called a watery grave. And so it represents your life, your death, and then your resurrection. It represents your life, your death, meaning that you've, you've died to sin. You've died to living your own way. You've put to death the, the poor motives of your heart. And you wake up a person with new motives a new life, a new, a new spirit that's combined with the Holy Spirit. Behold, you are therefore a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old has passed away, the new has come. A person who has been freed from guilt and condemnation. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. You know, when you confess your sin to God, he is faithful and just to forgive you of all of your sin. Sin has, sin is expensive. Sin has a price. Sin comes with a price tag, and the price tag is that it weighs on our spirit, the guilt, the condemnation, the embarrassment, the shame. And so when we come to God and we repent of the, our sin, the Bible says that he takes that sin and he throws it into the sea of forgetfulness, never to remember it again. It actually cleanses our conscience to know that if God be for me, who can be against me? So the joy and the love of serving Christ and accepting Jesus is what you're saying is, Jesus, you lived you died and you rose again just for me. And I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it's the power of God unto salvation. I'm going to tell the world about what God has done for me. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God for setting me free. And so we do immersion. The life, the death, and the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ being recognized and symbolized in our own life. Baptism is in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. It's based on the scriptures and pledge that they are in communion with the Trinity. So let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all. So we believe in the triune God, the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And so when we do baptism, we do baptism in that name. And we baptize you in, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in Jesus' name. Praise God. So now, hallelujah, that concludes the class. 
It's not a big class, not a long class. And so if you're ready to be baptized, you got an assignment. And the assignment is, 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 is that what you have to write a statement, at least four sentences at a minimum. What does this baptism mean to you? What does this baptism symbolize for your walk with the Lord? What does it mean to you? And what does it symbolize for your walk with the Lord? So those of you that will be participating in our baptism in our physical location, which is at 314 Waterman Avenue, as you prepare for our baptism services, uh, which will be held, the, the dates will be given to you. Um, you know that when you come to the, to the service, you're going to have to give your um, statement, your statement of faith, and you're going to give your declaration. Now, those of you that are around the world that are watching this broadcast and you're a part of our Bread of Life community, international, global community, you can participate in a baptism right at any body of water that you can have. If, if it's your bathtub, if it's um, the beach, if it's the river, if it's the canal, whatever it is. And another believer has to be a person, a person who is, who is walking with the Lord and has a, has a testimony of faith and, and loves Jesus. That person can baptize you because baptism, remember, it represents your decision, your conversion, your decision to follow Jesus. And so, so that we have a record of your baptism, what you're going to do is record that baptism and you're going to email that to us so that when we have our celebration, our milestone celebration, we can put your name, we can put your picture and you can be a part of the global community that's being, that's, um, that's being impacted by the gospel of Jesus Christ. So we're extremely excited about the fact that you've accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. This is your second step in your walk with the Lord. Second step is baptism. Now, if you're a person who's been baptized already, just simply send us a copy of your certificate or the name and the date and the time that you were baptized so that we can put that in our records as we continue to do our best to disciple every single person that comes into the family of Bread of Life. I'm Pastor Rudy Mosley, Senior Pastor of Bread of Life. It's a joy and a privilege to come alongside you as you continue to walk out your spiritual walk with Jesus. God bless you.